All righty. Today's episode, if we can call it an episode, is brought to you by the letter C. We usually jokingly do that because I'm a Sesame Street fan till I die, ride or die with Big Bird and the crew. But uh, we are going to be talking to the team behind one of the more famous and possibly arguably the largest comic book company out of not just Nigeria, but West Africa for certain, possibly Africa as a whole, who knows. Um, it is uh, a real big pleasure to introduce them to you guys. My name is Jay Abaje. I'm with the Niger Nerds. Also have some of my usual suspects here, Doc Ball. What's up? Hey, everybody. How you doing? And Olawale. What's good? Hi, everyone. Good to be here as usual. Despite what we see, there's no other Niger nerd as far as we're concerned in this call. Um, <laughs> so we're going to be switching it up. Our guests are from the, the, the Comic Republic. Uh, I'm going to start off by introducing um, Wale Aweleche. Um, hi. Um, and despite what Jay says, um, I'm, not on, I'm not one of the Niger nerds today, but I'm still Niger nerds. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Last but definitely not least, the legendary, the man, the myth, G. Day Martin, CEO and head of Comic Republic. Thanks for joining us. Hi, guys. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, just so you guys know, I'm a Niger nerd by feeling among. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome to, you're welcome to feel among, definitely, for sure. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Um, I have personally been a big fan of this comic book company for the last five years. Um, I've been reading their, their stuff online for some time, reading a lot of their works. But I, I, thinking back, I remember, because I had to go check, I, I received my first, one time I reached out and said, you know, I wanted to get some of their comics, some of their old stuff. And I received an email with a link, I think it was to a drive or a Dropbox, I think, and that was in 2016. Um, and I was re I went through that, burned through everything there, read a whole bunch of comics and thought, wow, this amount of quality is coming out of Nigeria. This is a, a group with a vision. So we're gonna kick things off by just kind of keeping it informal, but asking a few questions. And I'm not gonna lie, the first question that comes to my mind is, what was your inspiration for starting Comic Republic, like what led to that? Like what, what makes a guy living in Nigeria with all its issues and challenges wake up one day and say, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to start a comic book company. And not only am I gonna start one, I'm going to make it something that I can live by. <laughs> you know, it's not gonna be a hobby. This is going to be an actual business. So I'm tossing that question to Jide. What led to that? What, led, what started everything? Why is false? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what it, I, and I'm literally saying that because he didn't kick the idea out of my head. He encouraged it. I literally, and and this is no joke. So we were on, is it Abdullah or Deku? You know, Wally had this, you know, nice bachelor's pad. And I had a girlfriend then. And Wally's place was where I would escape when I wanted to just be typing <laughs> and not send anything else in the world. And I used to draw on my own because that was my favorite pastime. And then I would scribble superheroes and I would take it to Wale. And I'd be like, Wale, I'm thinking about making this a character. And Wale would be like, yeah, it's possible. Let me show you what other guys are doing. And then he introduced me to manga. And then I'll come and draw a design. I'm like, hmm, that's good. But it looks too much like this. And he literally encouraged the thought about doing it, you know, officially. And, you know, making it into something. Because he kept showing me what was happening outside. Wow throwing the ideas back and forth. Now, nah, this is stupid. This works and all of that. I was just excited that somebody had my time. I can tell you for a fact that we all believe Wale is a bad influence when it comes to achieving great things. That he really helps us <laughs> jump into, jump in the deep end. So that's great to know. Great to know. Yeah. Wale, let me flip the question to him since he got it. Apparently, because this is something I didn't know myself. I actually didn't realize, and this was, I think it was one of our recordings, when I said, when you joined Comic Republic, and he said, um, correction. <laughs> I've been there from the beginning. And I said, really? I, so I, I have to say, by the way, did a great impression of Wally there. Yes. I, I actually thought I was hearing his voice in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> that definitely was true. Hey, real quick question, by the way. That just kind of brings the question. How long have you guys been friends? 
Oh, another wrong question. As I knew, <laughs> I literally, I'm not making this up. I knew Ali when I was five or six years old. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. Literally, our moms used to, you know, my mom used to literally like send me to Wally's parents' house because Wally's parents were very strict and very responsible, though, despite what Wally turned out to be. I was going to say, like, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, my mom used to send me to a place to, like, you know, just go and play games with that irresponsible friend. And, you know, from the time we were five, we literally were neighbors. And it was one of those friendships that, you know, he went to a different school because I think he went to Lag or something. I can't even remember anymore. And then mm-hmm. I went to Ife, but somehow we just still kept it. So anytime he came back home, it was either Wally's house or my house. And then even when we started having girlfriends and working, while I moved to the island, Wally moved to the island. We just somehow just, you know, till this day, it's very annoying, but he's still here. <laughs> that's, quite a, that's, quite a, that's quite a blessing when you find out that there's people you couldn't have been friends with that far back. You guys have been friends since last millennium. You know, that's, you know, the new generation doesn't understand that there's people who've had friendships that long. But uh, that goes back to my question to Ali. So in his case, you were the reason. <laughs> so what was the inspiration for encouraging him? Why did this come about? Um, okay, so it's, it, it's more like, um, so what he's talking about is when, when he wanted to start Comic Republic. And of course, um, the idea was, I knew that it was something he could do. Um, and the reason I knew it was something he could do was, as he said, we've known each other since we were really young. Um, that was back in the day we lived at Ogba. Um, there was, there was a um, sort of an LSDPC, I don't know, that's a, that's a complicated Nigerian term. Basically, there was a, um, a housing project in a part of Lagos in Nigeria um, where we lived. Uh, and his family moved in there. Um, and as he said, um, his mom used to um, sort of send him off to our compound. We had a little compound where there were two families living and he used to come visit us both then. Um, and he was a real geek. And that, at that time, he had this massive um, book he used to carry around. Uh, it was uh, A3 paper, I think. Um, and he had this comic, which I have no idea whether it still exists. But if it does, it would be really great if we could find it and Comic Republic could publish it. Um, He drew it um, all in pencil. Um, And this was back when we were really young. Um, And um, uh, Jide, is it okay for me to to mention its name? All right. He called it Nemesis back then. Yeah. And it was really cool. I'm not going to give more more details about it. But back then, uh, we were sort of blown away by how... um, how detailed and complex his his art was right Right. and back then of course i had my head full of all sorts of ideas and i used to sort of fill my dad used to give me these diaries um, and i used to fill them up with all these story ideas i had so of course when you're a child you don't really know that your art is terrible and if your parents are nice they don't tell you so i used to draw lots of comics then the the art was really bad um, and after a while, I, I, I grew discerning enough to know my art was terrible. And so I, I stopped drawing and I started just writing. So I had all these stories, right? Um, and then he would kind of come and then we, we would talk about them and I just kind of recite them to him. So we, at that time, we sort of had this idea that uh, who knows, maybe someday we might do this, right? Um, but I think um, what stayed in my mind was just sort of the knowledge that this was a thing that this guy can do, even if I can't. So later on, um, of course, as he said, we went off to uni and we we did our, we each did our thing and then we bumped into each other again, uh, Victoria Island. Um, and then he started showing up with more paper and more pencil drawings um, that were even better than they were when he was young. And then he was saying, I, I want to do this thing. And I'm like, of course you want to do it, do it. And that, that's, that's it. That's it pretty much. Um, 
I'm just impressed that he came up with something as cool named as Nemesis at that age. I mean, most people were coming up with some of the weirdest names. Some of the guys I knew who drew comics back then, they were coming up with some asinine names, you know, that were either already taken or were just ludicrous. You know, everybody from Power Man to, to, to Niger Boy or, Niger, or, or, you know, one guy actually had something along the line of Fulani something. I don't recall. It, I saw all kinds of names, but it was, at least they didn't lack for originality. So that kind of raises the question, uh, what were your comic book influences? Like, I, I'm curious to know, what did a young G. Day Martin live to read every time he saw it? Like, what was it that could not pass you by and that you would probably kill to lay your hands on? Here's the funny thing, right? It, it's that I really just liked the regular comic books, but I had a funny twist to it, which was really, even right now, I'm thinking, why was my mind thinking that way? I like the regular stuff. It was Superman, Spider-Man, X-Men, Conan, um, Tarzan, regular stuff. I wasn't even really into manga, right? But the way I looked at comic books was that I would look at a comic book and I could tell everything that was wrong with it. That was the way my mind worked. It was very weird. And even till now, it's that way. As a critic at heart. Annoying <laughs> to the team because I'll be like, they want to do this, and I'm like, this will not fly. And they're like, what? I was like, it just doesn't work. And they're like, we can make it work. I'm like, no, Joro's here. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, you know? And that's how I always saw comics. And when, for example, everybody in comic book, even though I'm a big Superman fan, when I was creating Guardian Prime, one of the major principles that I had was that everything wrong with Guardian Prime, with Superman, I was going to fix with Guardian Prime. I had loads of issues, for example, like, why should an alien be our, our savior? Why should an alien be the predominant hero on Earth? It didn't make sense to me. That's number one. Why should Superman be able to catch people in full speed and they don't just, you know, this <laughs> club, you know, why, you know, why should he just be wearing glasses and nobody can recognize who he is? Why is he walking about in tights? You know, all those kind of things were the things I was like, okay, I was going to create right. a character that was similar, but better in the sense that all the things that were wrong with this character would be fixed, you know? And I mean, are you really saying I don't look different taking my glasses off between this and, I mean, see? Who was I that? I, I don't, you. who was that guy? I, I mean, I don't recognize him. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you raise a number of good points. Like uh, uh, your suspension of disbelief would only stretch so far, as, even as a kid, even as a younger person. So you spotted these things and thought, you know, we could probably do better, right? So I love the comic books at the same time. So even with the names, I had a problem with things like, why do you have to put man, boy, woman behind it? You know, so I was coming up with names like mm -hmm. Nemesis mankind and i could go on they were very weird name at that point in time that i felt and this was you know before people started naming things that made more sense now back mm. then you know major lag and stuff like that i just was not comfortable with the man or the woman being at there. i'm like we can see that he's a guy why do you have to call him spider-man he's a man obviously why do you have to call her wonder woman she's a woman obviously you know so I had all those issues, and I still really loved comics. Let me tell you something freaky. As at the time I was finishing my secondary school days, I used to draw so much that my mom was freaked out that she put all my comics together that I had drawn, and she lit them. Yep. Let me Whoa. Tell you. <laughs> okay. I'm not surprised to hear that, actually. Horror stories for life. Hold on, guys. 200 comics. Oh, God. At the end of secondary school, I had drawn 200 comics. It was traumatizing. So it's one of those things that people... <laughs> I'm traumatized right now just hearing the story. <laughs> oh, wow. So you mean Nemesis is gone? It's... Um... Oh, it's ashes. It's ashes. All right, yeah. let's, pour out, let's pour out a little liquor for, for Nemesis <laughs> and all these 200 comics. I mean, that, but that just goes to, sorry, you had to ask something, Dako. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that, what you just said there leads me to, uh, to the question of what I've wanted to ask, because being somebody who's, or, who lived in Nigeria and had, had dreams of Nigerian comics, but in my, in my, in my world, I guess I, I kind of grew up and I was talked out of it. Uh, how do you still have, you know, like the, the spirit of stubbornness to carry on thinking that, oh, actually, you know what, I can still make this pay for me. 
I can still do it and you know make it a paying concern. I mean, I mean the, the, the mantra I was drummed in all the while in Nigeria, and I didn't I did not have a a Wale, I guess, or you or or I didn't have a GJ like you had was you will never make this like a worthwhile job. You need to get a real job. So I had all of those, to be honest, right? And I can't explain it myself. All I can tell you is that sometimes I literally believe I was made for this, right? Because like he said, from five years old, all I would do all day is just draw. All I would do is think comics. And even when I got to the point where I was trying to be cool, right? I started riding bikes, you know, I was, I mean, for lack of a better word, a ladies man in school. What you would catch me doing when I'm alone in my room is draw comics. It, it, just, it just, it was like it was me. It just stuck, right? And so the moment I could afford to start a business, right? I mean, as at the time I started and while I knew, I already had a successful fashion business that was doing very well at that point in time. And then I told everybody around me, Unfortunately, my girlfriend at the time, who is my wife now, was very excited about it. I said, I want to stop my business and I want to start drawing comics. And she didn't even try to, again, like Wally, bad influence. All of them were like, look, it's almost like they felt like they've, they've known that this is what I always wanted to do. Right, yeah, like, like what took you so long? It, exactly, and they were like, go ahead. And for a second, to be honest, you know, first stay with Wally, then stay with her. I was like, are these people okay? Well, they said I should do it well. And, you know, and then I, I just pushed on. And it was difficult even starting, even up until now. But, you know, when something is difficult but easy, I don't know how to describe it. Mm. Mm. All right. The pains don't feel like pains. They're there, but they feel like another thing I have to do. It's like cooking you know, cooking is annoying, but when you really like what you're about to eat, you will take the pain and cook. Right. You know, and it's been for me. I just think I was made for it somehow. I know that sounds cliche or weird, but that's how I've come to understand it as of now. Because mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you there's a formula. I can't tell you I was dug it. I just stuck with it. It doesn't so, sound cliche. Yeah. It doesn't it sound doesn't. cliche. It's like it's like doing push-ups and seeing gains afterwards, you know, it's, it's what it is. I am, I am, I, I am looking over the history of comic books and thinking about the legends and you and I know there's so many legends of the game um, globally, but look, the American comic book industry is where a lot of us draw our, um, not so much our inspiration as much as our, uh, initial they put the industry on a global map and pedestal and it continues to be that way to this day so my question to you is you know as far as your art inspiration as far as the guys who kind of you looked at and they they they, they stood out as okay this is even as a young artist or as a person who was drawing were there any people that kind of stuck with you that made you think i want to draw like this guy at what point did you start differentiating the different artists and identifying those who you, you flowed in their direction versus those who you just thought that's cool, but not for me? Okay, so there were three major people, right? The first guy, and for some reason, his name just skipped my mind, but I, I'm hoping somebody can help me here. He drew Panic in the Sky, Superman Panic in the Sky. I don't know if any of you remember that comic. I do, Bring, yeah. I do remember that comic. What year was this? We're talking about early 90s, right? Yes, early 90s. Panic in the Sky, Superman. Um, and Dan Jurgens. No, wait. Is it Gary Ordway? I see the comic. I can't see the artist. One sec. Yeah, for some reason, the name is, has just completely left me. He was I like, see Roger Stern. It sounds like Roger Stern. Oh, well, I, the artist, the artist. I, think it, I think it was Dan Jurgens. Dan Jurgens, yes. It's Dan Jurgens. <laughs> And so that was oh, yeah. his, his line, you know, he, he had a way of, you know, creating very muscular guys, but that still looked believable, you know, not um, some other artists that came after that would draw chest bigger than the whole body. You know. We're not naming names. That's fine. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, who knows? We might meet them in the future. I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, they should, own, they should own their, their crimes, I think. 
We're talking about certain guys who could who couldn't draw chess proportionately, <laughs> and they always yeah, forgot how to draw of, feet. That was a nice artistic show. Yeah, you should be proud of it. <laughs> yes, that's it. <laughs> oh my goodness! And then I discovered Jim Lee. Okay. Oh, nice. Yeah. I thought it said Jimmy. <laughs> Nice. Let me flip the question. Sorry, real quick. I wanted to draw Wale in here because you guys were growing side by side, more or less. Like you're creating and you're creating as an artist. And I'm looking at Wale, and Wale is the guy who um, I know more as a writer. And I'm curious to know who were his writing influences as well, reading these books at that time. Like, who were, the, were there any comic book writers that were beginning to stand out to you and thinking, oh, wow, I want to be like so and so at some point? So um, from the comic book angle, um, there's like, it's, it's pretty simple who, the, who, my, who my early writing influences were. And the very first was Jim Stalin. Um, this, this, is, this is simply an accident of chance. Um, it's because when I was young uh, and um, at the time, my mom um, temporarily uh, left Nigeria, she went to work as a nurse in England, um, and she would return from time to time, um, and she would bring comic books for us, and uh, she brought Batman comics, and this happened after a period of what I would call drought, where when we moved to Nigeria, I was sort of cut off from geek culture for a while, so I was still kind of stuck with my sort of like childish love of Superman, and then I began to see these new Batman comics, and they were really sort of grown up serious comics. These were like the, the mid eighties when that whole change was happening. Um, and I read these comics and I thought, oh my God, this is, this is great, right? And so that's why I started sort of coming up with my own sort of comics then, sort of started writing my own comics then. But even then at the time, um, I was hoping to draw comics, not necessarily write them, right? So um, when I stopped, writing comics, um, my influences became more uh, um, on the prose side, uh, because as I grew older, I moved on to fantasy novels, and I discovered Dune, and I discovered The Lord of the Rings. Um, I read the entire Lord of the Rings series. I read uh, The Silmarillion. I read the entire Chronicles of Narnia um, and Dune. And I'm naming those series specifically because they had a massive impact on me. Um, I read them over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. So sort of looking back at the sort of thing I, um, the sort of influences that I can see in my writing nowadays, a lot of the, the prose that I write, um, I can see a lot of um, Tolkien and I can see a lot of Frank Herbert. Those are the guys that really inspired me to to write. Okay. Right, can I ask a question? And I, I think this might be pertinent to both of you guys. It's how on earth do you have so much information about what are called the myths of Nigeria? Now, I was always interested in it, but back in my day, you, don't, you literally have to go and speak to Baba Lau to understand about this thing. And that was totally frowned on. You know, in my family, you know, almost anybody, you know, if I told my mom that I'm going to see Baba Lau, I'll probably be locked in the room, you know, and have, have some uh, Muslim pastor come and try and pray for me. So I just, and I, but I know you guys have got so much information. I just wondered how you came about that information and what length did you go to to, to gather it? Okay, so that's a really good question, and the, there's a pretty simple answer to it, right? Um, look for somebody who knows it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why I said that. One of the things that I thank God that I was able to catch on quickly was that teamwork works, right? Quickly. Um, so even from the very first day, and while will confirm, and which is what, you know, which was a huge factor in us succeeding was... I could draw comics. Like you said, I would have done, I've done, I had my own personal stories, right? With that, I would draw a complete comic book from start to finish. But somehow I had the mental fortitude to take it to a writer and say, what do you think about this, right? Even though I could create a whole comic by myself, right? I could come up with my own stories. I could feel like my, my characters were the best, but I needed somebody like Warwick to verify Wally that, okay, from a story point of view, 
this made sense, right? And so that extended to most of um, what we do and still extends to most of what we do as um, creators in Comic Republic. And you know, one of the major things I saw earlier is that, look, we need to, we're not going to touch a comic book if we don't have a specialist in that field, that's number one. And then we allow the specialist dictate. It's very weird. Uh, when people see from the outside, they kind of think that I make most of the decisions, right? I really just put my foot down at the very end when a decision needs to be made by either or. But most of the creative processes were done by creators who, who come into Comic Republic and know these things, right? So at first we were doing um, people in tights, but our strategy then was to introduce heroes the way people knew heroes already, right? And at that point in time, we always had it that we we're going to do more traditional things. But because again, I had this very critical eye, I was like, look, I had to find somebody who was really good with historical, mythical stories and issues before we delve into it. It's one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of, for example, Hausa characters. And you know, we have more Yoruba characters than we have more Igbo characters. It's not because we don't want to do any of those things, but we don't have a lot of Igbo writers. We don't have a lot of Hausa writers. The moment we do, and the people who are sound with, you know, those traditions, those things. We've even started looking at getting right presently. We're actually on an active search for writers around the world, you know, from places like Europe, from different places, so that we can actually develop authentic fictional stories that would resonate with those areas and those traditions. So fortunately for us, we found somebody that was really good with, you know, um, Nigerian folklore. He's practically a Bible at it. And, you know, he started pointing us in the right directions. And then, you know, it was easy from there. Is this somebody who's a part of your team or somebody you just refer to like a consultant who consults for you? Out of our team. Gotcha. Well, on that, that's a, a point that, you know, that were brought in that I was thinking about because you'll find that this also seems to have, by the way, just in case you're all watching, you heard it here first, if you're a sound and you're a writer and you know a lot about house of folklore and stuff like that. Yeah. Comic Republic wants to hear from you. <laughs> but um, in reading the, the books that come out of Comic Republic, there almost seems to be this search for pre-colonial African identity. Like there's a, there's a, there's a, determin there's a determination to, even in the writing, it looks like the people are discovering or trying to find who they are. They're going through a journey of learning. So I don't know if that was an artistic choice to kind of um, uh, a creative choice as a way of you know, covering up exposition or just as, as a great, you know, a narrative plot device to just help us be like our gateway into this journey ourselves like what's going on here why are these people oh, i am you know who is this and why are they talking like this and stuff like that so i'm it's, it's something we see um one of the themes i think is there and i want to ask about this specifically is there seems to be this theme of ancestral heroism and by flipping that over ancestral um villainy like, you know, are these people good or bad? Are they just complex characters? Is everybody the hero of their story? Just because they were back in that time, does that mean that they were, you know, the good people or the bad people? In, in one of your books, I think um, this, the, the writing after Wale mentions that he is growing up, he'd be looking over at the ocean and wondering to himself, you know, what did African heroes look like? What, what lurked beneath the waters? What, did, what, what would make an actual hero of that time? So how much of your work do you feel you devote to just the concept of identifying that some of the things we think are are bad you know okay and, and what does this mean to you let me just ask the question in a different way what does this mean to you the concept of heroism in as it relates to our ancestors as it relates to people who went before us a hundred years ago 500 years ago a thousand years ago i see you guys write about those themes and those things come out a lot so let me just throw that out there as an open question Riley? Okay. So you, you know, you know that, you know, that question was my question. Um, so um, one, I think one of the things that I bring to the table of Co at Comic Republic is that I'm a massive um, history fanatic. Um, when I was really young, my dad gave me a book called the history of West Africa. 
I just, I can't remember the name of the author because I would love to get it again, but it seems like it was one of those limited print Nigerian published books, which means that it might actually be completely out of print and lost now. But uh, it had, uh, there were the calories on the cover and it was really interesting. Oh, wow. And it, um, it went into great detail about the history of West Africa in ways that we weren't taught in school, um, either in Nigeria, in, in this country. It's like, um, you, you, it, was, it was a huge eye opener for me because um, it revealed to me at that age that there were empires and there were kingdoms and there were civilizations before colonialism. Um, I'm not sure if many of you are, uh, remember this, but in the 80s, um, living in Nigeria, um, our education was a very colonial one. And we, we pretty much had the idea that life sort of started at independence. Uh, it was like, okay, the founding fathers of Nigeria, blah, blah, blah. And then before then, it was um, um, uh, Nigeria, the British colony. Uh, and there was just nothing beforehand. And there were no records. So that was literally what we were taught in school. Um, there were no written records. And so there's, there's no history. It's all just darkness. Um, and this was a huge eye-opener for me. And from then, um, I had this hunger for knowledge and I kept on looking for it. And I would discover new things. Um, and it filled me with this desire to sort of bring a lot of that um, forward in a way that a lot of people would be able to consume it. Um, and that, that drove a lot of my sort of writing ambition. So, of course, when I had the chance to do a whole, to put a lot of that into practice, especially in Comic Republic, um, there were a lot of things that, um, there were a lot of ideas that I brought to the table that were, that sort of existed in that space. Um, and um, the, I think what was, probably the most important catalyst for it was the fact that Jide's own um, ambitions for Comic Republic, the things that he wanted to do, and you can tell this from the design of Guardian Prime, um, were things that were almost entirely around identity. Um, in fact, to be honest, a lot of the core ideas behind um, some of um, our most prominent books um, didn't originate from some of the ideas that I had for story, but rather originated from what GD wanted to do. So for example, take Ajay. I think Ajay is a book that encompasses what you just talked about, GD, which is basically taking something um, pre-colonial um, and then asking that ambiguous question, oh, we've been taught that Ajay, which is Ajay are very bad, are they bad, are they good? You know, what happens before colonialism? the actual idea to create a book and call it Ajay didn't come from me. It was entirely Jide's idea. Um, and I actually tried to shoot it down um, and he kept on coming back with it. So, um, and it was only after he convinced me that it has to be called Ajay, right? That I sat back and I thought, oh, wow, this actually does kind of line up with the kind of stuff we want to do. And then the idea of the idea started rolling in. So um, you will see that there is a bit of a thread um, running through a lot of our books that sort of does that. Um, and it is not by mistake. So I don't know if I can add just something really small to what Wale has said, that is a very important ingredient. And I think anybody that is in the creative process should do that just quickly. Um, is that we have a strength of unity in Comic Republic that's just really, really amazing, where we allow everybody play to their strengths, you know, but at the same time, the whole team trusts me so much that they allow me be the binding force in the sense that when I say, okay, let's take this, let's take this, let's take that, and let's merge it together. And so there's a freedom for you to play into what you know very well. And you know, and, and toss it forward and say, let's how let's mix it together. And here's why I say that, and it will explain a lot um, of your what you have noticed is that, for example, I'm really into let us identify what makes Nigeria today. Let's look at the things that we know as Nigerians today. How is the Nigerian community today? Because I got really tired of what people, anytime people want to talk about Nigeria or Africa. You know, it's almost as if Africa has been, is now synonymous with custom and 
you know, the past, right? But I'm like, let's show how Nigeria is today. People like you and me that go about wearing jerseys, that use the latest technology, right? And then Wally came in and Wally is always like, look, we need to get the historical part of things correct, right? And, you know, I, I need to mention Toba. Toba will come and say, okay, I know a lot. Toba is the guy in our team who is very good with historical um, things. Come back and say, okay, I know a lot of the history. And I say, okay, Toba, how can we relate that history to today? So in a lot of our stories, you see a combination of, you know, Wally's ideas of making sure that we're historically correct, you know, and all the things that have been deemed bad are good, and the things that were bad are portrayed in a way that we could understand. And I'm like, okay, let's bring it into the lives of Nigerians and Africans as it is today. And so you get that nice mix, mix sorry, of history, but yet in a modern setting with heroes that look like heroes of today, right? And not us looking like people that are based or should be forgotten in history. And a lot of our books, a lot of our stories, a lot of our characters reflect those two sides of, you know, everybody playing to their strength, but somehow coming to one unity and telling one story. I was going to ask, um, the, it seems like a lot of work goes into um, the research. Uh, but now we're hearing that a lot of passion also goes into that uh, research. It's, so it's not just, okay, I'm trying to not make mistakes, but it seems like like hearing what Wally said about um, uh, what, we, what, we, what we're taught in schools, I just, it never occurred to me that, yeah, they actually basically erased all our history in schools. Um, seems like there's a lot of rights to be wronged. And I can see how um, writing and producing comics for Comics Republic will fill you with a certain level of um, mission. Like, okay, yeah, we are doing something really great. So my question is, with all that research, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure that the, research, the amount of work and research you're going to do, only a small bit of it is going to end up on the pages that we end up seeing. So what happens to the rest of that energy? Are you guys planning to channel it into something else, maybe like a, a show or something? I don't know. Or is that, just, is that, just, is that just the cost of doing things right? Hmm. Uh, let me start, and I think Wally will end this, this question. So the first thing I'll tell you is that everything you've seen that we have released is like 2% of all the story acts that we have. Exactly. Right? And, and that's the thing. A lot of people think we're slow or that we're just turning out a lot of stuff, it's all connected. And you guys are going to see it in the next year or two. Um, we have, because of all this history and research that we've done, there's so much interconnection in history and with all the characters. And you think we just scraped only 2%. It's why, if you notice, we get a lot of criticism about, you know, it looks like we're kind of slow. Yeah, we get that, that a lot. Oh, you guys are just releasing one issue. You guys are just doing this. And that's because we can't tell the next story if we've not told this other story, right? And so we try to develop this other story to a certain point before we start telling this story. And because they're all connected. And so again, we've hit just 2%. If we, if, if we start, let me put it this way. We have a character which we've only released a pre-story, Morimi, right? that I can tell you that Toba has written a 52-page script for already. We've only done a four-page intro. And the script is already on ground. Did you say more any? So this is different from Ireti? Yes. Ireti, oh, okay. no, Moremi, and Ireti... Um, yes. Yeah, okay. two completely different characters. Oh, okay. but, Okay, I'll calm down. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get excited. I'll calm down a bit. You see, we can't, we can't tell, we can't, because if we start with the legend of Morami, right, it will make Bidemi look watery. So we have to start with Bidemi, and then you start to wonder where did she get this great power from? And then when we go back to the legend of Morami, which in short, wow. by, by Vanga's issue six, you guys will see how powerful Bidemi is. Oh, okay, so uh, I'm happy again. So you are talking about saying more me. That's the, the kind of assessor of uh, beating me. Yes. Okay, okay, fine. I'm, I'm, okay, my 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 second, my second is back again. Because that's my <laughs> favorite character in your whole, whole um, yeah. Uh, comics. Yeah. Good. Comics. 
So just to answer that, this is what we're doing with all that research. We have a whole world, a whole universe. We have stories that will span us the next. So actually, to be honest, when we started, we have a 10-year plan. It sounds weird when we started. 10-year plan, 10-year scripting, ready. How does that sound weird? I'm curious. Who thinks that's weird? That's yeah. impressive. That's brilliant. That's you're, you're setting the standard. Is, that's what it should be. It is, it is weird based on the history of comics. But you know, after seeing the MCU, it's not weird anymore. I actually, that actually brings me to a question. Because that what you just said to me sounds like the Marvel uh, model of connect, a fully connected universe that everything ties together. Um, is, is, was, that, was that something done on purpose? Or is that something you agreed to later on? As opposed to the... That's uh, pretty interesting. Let me let Wally take this. Okay, Wally, Wally, you go for it. Yeah. Yeah, because, um, okay, so to answer your question, upfront, yes, on purpose. And uh, to add a little bit more, it was, it has been the subject of intense debate between myself and GD. And it's interesting, there's a, when we, when we talk about a lot of things that were sort of the result of debate between us, there is a sort of pattern in that um, I, I tend to end up losing a lot of these battles um it, which 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 is kind of weird from my um from my standpoint but then i end up coming around to it and then i end up being a big part of executing on it in the early days um we ran into this we we we, we very quickly got this realization that as far as logistics go with comic production um script writing would always outpace um art um and so if you just let your writing run rampant you would write a whole ton of stuff and you just never get around to publishing it and you wouldn't even have any idea of how what you're doing is being received and so you would sort of lack direction um, so there was a lot of um, uh, should do, do we pace ourselves do we do, what do we do do we do we plan do we write out the script late etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and I was of the opinion then that we needed the individual stories to sort of uh, exist on their own so that they would have no limits and that later on we could sort of find a way of interconnecting them. But uh, Jide sort of had this really long horizon to, because he, he thought, uh, no, we're not going to start like that and then change later. We've got to start right now. Uh, and he was adamant right from the beginning that any new thing we did had to be part of the shared universe. And that was a real source of uh, a lot of <laughs> friction in the early days um, that eventually sort of kind of died down because you eventually began to realize, oh, wow, this is why it works. It works because um, right from the earliest day, we had always had to ask, we had always had to bring up this whole massive list of questions. And we had always had to sort of um, maintain a kind of internal record uh, it was a while before we canonized this into internal Bibles, but we had to maintain internal records of everything that we'd done, and we had to cross-check everything that we were doing against everything that we that we had already done, and we were doing this right from the beginning. Um, and I think that has paid off now. Um, yeah, so the short answer, yes. The long answer, yes, even more, because we debated it intensely internally that's interesting um you know in my um growing up with comics that cross-reference each other i only looked at it from a commercial um game standpoint like it's good to hear that you guys had other um considerations for doing um, reasons for doing that which had more to do with um, pacing yourselves properly as opposed to deliberately saying okay no let's make sure we connect the world so that people will be forced to buy more or read more um, episodes. Yeah, I one thing that you'll notice is that um, even if you read Comic Republic comics, if you read, because it's not, for, for one thing, even though we've been doing this for a long time, it's not as if we have loads of series that are like 200, 300 issues. They're still relatively short if you think about them in general terms. Um, you'd find that you don't get tied up in not unable to understand a book because you're not reading the other ones, right? The books still kind of feel as though they're standalone, 
But what you'll discover is that there's a lot of care taken to do things like locate, to, to handle things like location, timing. And in many cases, you will find the, the odd Easter egg that will let you know this is happening while this other thing is happening. Can I reveal an Easter egg, Wally? Can I, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> By all means. <laughs> There's a certain individual in almost all the comic books with one set, wearing a certain color that will connect towards the end. If you look carefully, you see him. The indicator is that he's in the same color. That's all that is impressive. That is impressive. Uh, no, no, I, I, I am actually, that is impressive. I actually am regretting letting you say that. <laughs> Because they're not supposed to look for it. Uh, it's, uh, okay. it's supposed to hit them. It's supposed to hit them. Don't worry, we can edit this out. We can edit this out of the video if 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 you want. But that's impressive. That is mad impressive. Right, I, I'm I'm rushing back now to go and start reading all over again. Let's see if I can spot this. <laughs> so, a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, we're gonna just, I guess, you know, um, take a quick break. But when we come back. One of the things I wanted to get to in conversation with you guys about has not just to do with the use of the themes that you're using, like, you know, heroism and uh, discovering history and all that, but also your use of African language and also how that plays a role, not just in, not just in the characters themselves, but also in the exploration of the meaning of, of, of the source of their power and how that power is demonstrated. Anyway, we'll be back after this.